Friends, good morning. Welcome. It's lovely to be with you once again at the beginning of this new September term. I hope those of you who went away have had a lovely restful time. Uh, and those of you who haven't managed to get away, and I know that's a good number of you, you've had to keep working through or circumstances hasn't just allowed you that opportunity. Grace to you, beginning of another term without rest. Um, uh, I feel for you, good for you. Um, so here we are in the church building and if you look carefully, you can see I've got this metal bar going from one side of my ear to the other side, a bit like the Munsters, um, redeemed only by the halo of the, the stained glass window above me. Um, but it is always good to be in the church building. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because hopefully in the next few weeks we will partially be able to be back here again, but more of that um, in a few moments. It does feel a bit odd, doesn't it, uh, at the beginning of this new term. Uh, we are not where we would have wanted to be in life. Um, preferably, uh, Unlock would have completely have gone and life would have returned to some sort of new normal, but we are where we are and we're still having to exercise care about how we spend time together. But all seasons of recession and retreat, they call for moments of reinvention and opportunity, and that's what we're going to uh, be doing this term. Uh, and beginning with uh, Toolbox and Toolbox Tots. Now, Celia and Megan have done an amazing job over last term and this summer period. They've worked so hard at trying to rethink about how they can meet and they're doing so as we speak now on the field. So if you're not a part of that today but you'd like your children to be a part of that, then check out the church downloads, look at the church website, there's all sorts of information on there about how the children can begin to use the field because it's a larger open space, therefore a bit safer um, in order to enable toolbox and toolbox talks to meet in a fashion that we're able to do so. And Mike and his team also likewise for the youth be looking at the weekly communication that we send out to you. They likewise have been busy reinventing and reinventing and trying to find ways of meeting and uh, they're likewise on the field later on so look out for that. But for us as adults we are constrained a little bit more. Um, we will be meeting in the church, but we're going to be doing so with a restriction of 30 in the church building, because that's all we can fit in, in a safe distanced manner. Sadly, regulation at the moment also means that you will need to mask when you come in. And like with all the children uh, toolbox uh, events, you're gonna need to pre-book um, on the ticketing website, so be looking out for that. Um, uh, but it is, we will be here, the opportunity will be to be here at 10.30 for those who want to. And we'll be watching the same broadcast service that comes out on all your computer screens, but doing it corporately together on the big screens here in church. We're not yet able to do anything that's particularly live. Um, but we will, if you're a part of the church gathering, as of next week, um, we will, when we get to the point of sharing communion with one another on the screens, we'll turn the screens off in the church and we'll do that in a safe manner, corporately here together in the church building. So there's a little value added and a little something different uh, for the beginning of term. Now, I hope you've been a part of our series over the last six weeks. We've had a series of guest speakers. If you've missed them, they're all on our website. Um, they've been some really good discussions about how we might want to imagine the reinvention of life um, as we move forward. And uh, I'm so grateful to all those speakers for being a part of this. Um, if you've missed it, look back at them. They're worth listening to. But whenever we think about uh, reinventing and reimagining a different future. Of course, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, so what about us? What can my contribution be to a different world? Now, over lockdown, you may well have um, embarked upon all sorts of new skills, whether it be baking bread or getting fitter with um, Joe Watts's face, or you've 
learned to knit or blessed your neighbours with the violin or you've just simply read more books, well done. But the sort of change that I'm wanting to talk about this morning at the beginning of a new term is our own personal change. The deepening of our character, the deepening of our walk with God. And the reason I'm mentioning that is that I, I'm sure a bit like me, you, we're probably all feeling the same of, oh, it's another season of doing things on screen. And that can feel really tiring. And the, uh, a screen is never the, a perfect replication of what we are able to do corporately together. It can feel cold and sterile and distant, despite the amazing uh, team we have bringing you their inventiveness and creativeness. It can still feel a little separated. Um, it's a bit like watching TV as opposed to participating. And so there is a call for us, in a sense, to, to, to be a bit more purposeful, if you like, for the, uh, hopefully this final leg of how we are, this term in society, unable to gather together. I have a bit of grit about us that says, look, it, it's not ideal, I don't particularly enjoy it, but I'm going to do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. And I want to talk a bit about that this morning, but in the sense of how we personally look towards our own personal growth and change. And we're going to do so over the next uh, four weeks, coming four weeks, by thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, which Paul mentions in his letter to the Galatians. So if you've got your Bibles, do open them up at Galatians and Galatians chapter 5. And uh, as we've already had in our reading, Paul begins that letter by simply saying this. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the, uh, the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And Paul continues in that letter then to sort of draw a bit of a compare and comparison between two incompatible lives. The lives of the sinful nature, the lives of this world, or a life lived pursuing God. And they both have very different outcomes, and particularly in how we emerge as personalities and people. Because actually, Paul continues later in that passage simply to say that the fruit of the Spirit, the consequence of pressing into God and being purposeful in our relationship with God, is this that these qualities emerge. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Um, against such things there is no law. And Paul very much, very strongly says, it, it, if we want this, if we want these qualities, these godly qualities, then we need to pursue the life of the Spirit. Uh, Jesus Similarly said similar things, didn't he, when he looked at various fruit trees and vine trees and fig trees and said, you know, it's the fruit it bears depends upon its internal inner health. Um, if a tree is rotten at the core, uh, it'll produce bad fruit. If it's good in its core, it'll produce good fruit. And so the life of the spirit is about what's really going on inside of our core. Now, those of you who are astute and have good memories will remember that actually we looked at this as a mini-series probably two years ago in church. But I'm working on the basis that A, you've forgotten what we spoke about, and B, that actually out of that list, um, there is still stuff we all need to work on. There are still things we need to deepen in that the Lord might have something for us in all of those various qualities. And if you're not sure what those are, then you might like to turn to those closest to you and say, so which of these do I not do so well with? Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, love, joy, etc. And I'm sure they'll be very happy to let you know where you need to do a bit of homework. I'm not going to go into the qualities themselves this week. Um, Rich and Tim and Lou will be doing that in the weeks ahead. Um, but I want to move on, if I may, to uh, just setting the scene about for how we might approach uh, the emergence of these qualities in our lives. And Paul kind of moves on in the next chapter, chapter 6, verse 7, where he says something quite important that's helpful to us. Verse 7. And again, it's a, it's a compare and contrast. It's a, a lining up the two lives against each other and noting that they are not compatible. Verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. 
In other words, you can't, you can't trick him, you can't pretend he knows. A person reaps what they sow. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap. And the one who sows to please the spirit, from that spirit will reap. In other words, the seed we sow, the things we put in place, they will bear fruit. Now, the fruit that emerges is the miracle of the working of the Spirit. But what Paul is saying here is that there are some things we need to, or can be quite purposeful about, that sets the right scene, that allows the right conditions for growth. We have at the end of our uh, garden, Kathy and I, we've got a little allotment area and we have not particularly paid much attention to it over the last few years. Um, I have left it fallow. Now, you kind of think that that word fallow infers that it's neutral, that nothing is going to happen to it. Um, it's, it's just going to rest before a decision is made one way or the other. And sometimes we can do that in our spiritual lives. I think we kind of feel like if we don't engage, if we don't press in with prayer or study or, or fellowship or accountability or any of those things, then we're, we're not tying in with uh, the spirit of the world or, not, or necessarily the Spirit of God, we're just being a bit neutral for a period and therefore nothing happens. And actually nothing could be further from the truth because there is no neutral. We're either pressing in one way or we're allowing ourselves to drift in another direction. And if we took a look at our fallow, neutral allotment at the end of our garden, it is full of weeds and brambles and stuff that we hoped wasn't there but is there and if I was to try and plant anything there at the moment, um, it would just become strangled and swamped by the conditions of the plot. It, and that's just the way of it, isn't it? Choosing not to engage uh, is actually allowing ourselves to sit in the river of culture, but the river is a flowing river and we will drift on the current of culture and we will just find ourselves further and further away from a place where actually we are, the conditions are right for personal growth. And that brings me back to this earlier point about we might not want to be in this place where we're looking at the screen each week. We might not want to be in this place where it's difficult to meet, but we have to be purposeful. We have to press in. So what are some of the things we can put in place that will help us get into a place where growth is possible? I know over lockdown, lots of you have joined small groups. And uh, uh, I'm thrilled, and you would have felt the benefit of those groups. Um, but they will have been your own groups. So some of the groups I've heard that people have joined, book groups, lots of you have joined group, book groups to read together, which is fabulous, and I love that sort of thing. Some of you have groups called Gin by the Bin every Thursday evening, or something like that. And uh, that's been a lot of fun. You've valued the friendship, the fellowship, the conversation, the opportunity of being together corporately at the end of your pathways. Some of you um, have joined walking groups or Zoom quiz groups, or we've worked out in life that actually small groups really count. They have value. And maybe that's one of the uh, conditions we need to put in place for this term ahead to ensure we continue to grow, um, which is the opportunities afforded by small groups. And here, of course, I'm referring to Bible study groups, home groups, the groups that we set up as a church. And they do exactly the same thing as a book group or a gym by the bin or whatever it might be, a Zoom quiz group. It's friendship, it's fellowship, it's laughter, it's entertaining. But there are also opportunities to ask questions, to pray for one another, to support one another and to press into the word together. And lots of groups I know in this term are planning to meet either in the church building because that enables the space enables us to safely do that or on the church field but i would really recommend that's one of the conditions we put in place to enable personal growth that we are purposeful in our pursuit of a deeper understanding of the word and being prayerful together and of course the other disciplines that we need to put in place um, as just making space in our lives daily for reflection, contemplation, prayer, Bible study. The disciplines that say, I am turning my gaze, I'm fixing my gaze in this direction towards God. And as we do that, so opportunity 
begins to emerge. Kathy and I went uh, on a short break last week. We were um, camping on the Thames and uh, it was wet and it was cold and it was rainy, but our great love is swimming. And so we, uh, are on several occasions each day, jumped into the river and we swam. The Thames is a river of, of currents. We were by a weir, the current was quite strong. And it reminded me that there are seasons when, the, if the current is strong, I need to swim quite strongly in the opposite direction. And there was no standing still because you would get swept along under the bridge and lost forever over the next weir. So we had to be really purposeful. And my hope as we set into this new term is that we are purposeful, that we are swimming in the right direction. Paul continues here and he says in chapter six, he says this, um, uh, so the, the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us, let us not become weary in doing these things. He uses that phrase eternal life. Now eternal life in Hebrew thought uh, back in those days didn't necessarily just mean life after death. Um, it had something to do with the flourishing of life in the moment. And again, that's so true, isn't it? What Paul is saying here is for a fruitful life, for a flourishing life, for a life that is good with God and therefore will automatically then become good with one another, we need to sow. And where we sow with the right disciplines, um, so we will reap accordingly. And the fruit that is born is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there is no law. I know from that list one or two things I need to be working on. I have no doubt there are some there for you as well. Why don't we this term press into those together? Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, thank you for this word, your word that always remains eternal and true. We are so grateful for it. And we pray for this season ahead. Here we are again. It is slightly with a not a heavy sigh, but a sigh of, oh, it would be lovely for it to be different, but it's where we are. And so we uh, put our hands on our hearts and lift our hands in the air and say, yes, Lord, yes, we are here. We will be purposeful. We will do the right things that put us in a good place with you and therefore a good place with one another and allow opportunity for the growth that is needed in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.